here in the beginning of the church age, um, the church age has begun, the word of God has been spreading, it's spread among the Jews. In Acts chapter number 2, you have the amazing story of Pentecost, and Simon Peter, the same person mentioned here in Acts chapter 10, is the one who stands up and preaches, and he, and he preaches, and God does an amazing miracle, where as Peter preaches, people in 16 different languages were able to understand Peter and the message he was preaching. 16 different people groups that were represented there. And yet, each of those people groups, each of those people, were there in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. For this holy, this holy time period, this celebration of Pentecost, which comes after Passover. And, uh, and so here's Simon Peter, he's preaching. He's preaching to people of different ethnicities, but they're all Jewish people. And as time goes on, we'll see even later on in, in Acts chapter 11, I believe it is, um, you'll see the, the gospel going out, but still restricted to the Jewish people. And yet God is ready in the Great Commission progress to go beyond just the Jewish people, to go beyond just this area, to the uttermost. And so as we look here in this passage, we, we must realize that the gospel must reach across new frontiers for the work of the Great Commission. But what will convince us to get involved in new frontiers for the gospel's sake. I mentioned earlier, we get into ruts, we get into our comfort zone. And this is true in so many areas of our lives. What we eat, our exercise, what we do at work, who we talk to, where we sit at church. You know this is true when it comes to how we share the gospel as well. A lot of times, we get very comfortable with where we're at. And maybe we have something that we do regularly. Maybe we're very regular and intentional about sharing Christ. But sometimes God wants you to do something else as well. You know, maybe you're really good about handing out gospel tracts or participating in, in mailings to the community to get the gospel out. But maybe, maybe God's stirring your heart right now to give to missions or to personally speak to that coworker, or that friend or that family member with the gospel. It's very easy for us to stay in our comfort zone. And at this point, Simon Peter's here. He's very much in his comfort zone. He's having a very successful ministry, but it's a ministry with a very limited scope. Peter's been traveling throughout the Mediterranean world. He's been able to, by the power of Jesus Christ, do miracles that have validated his ministry. He's really at a high point in his ministry when God confronts him with a new task. And we're going to see that in just a little bit here in this chapter, in Acts chapter number 10. And in this chapter, we're going to see three characters who all have their role in the gospel crossing new frontiers. The first character in the gospel crossing new frontiers from Acts chapter number 10 is simply the seeker. The seeker. People are seeking the truth. Cornelius and some of those around him here in Acts chapter 10 were such people. He's described in verse number 2 as devout. You could describe him as godly, just, and faithful. And one who fears God. He was an example from our perspective of a good man, but he was still a lost man. Cornelius was a good lost man. We see he was devout, he was God-fearing, he was generous, he was prayerful. His actions, so many of his actions are in the right place, but his heart was not yet cleansed. And it's important for us to realize, even here at the beginning of the new year, that although sincerity is important, sincerity and good works do not save. Maybe like, well, yes, we know this, of course, but as we look around at the world around us, there are a whole lot of people who are sincere in their path, they're sincere in their faith or in their worldview, and it's very easy for us to just say, coexist. Coexist, just like the bumper sticker. Leave them be, they're happy, they're okay with their lives, and to forget that their path, even if they're comfortable on it, is not leading them to heaven in a relationship with God, but is leading them to hell. And so as we think about this, sincerity and works do not save, let's remember, but grace through faith does. And so we need to share that message of grace from our God to people so that they can respond in faith. In Luke chapter 11, in Jesus' own ministry, in verse number 9, the Bible says, and I, in the context it's Jesus here, say unto you, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. 
For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. And there's a, probably many different ways you could apply this passage. And here in Luke chapter 11, it's not expounded on, uh, in, a, in a ton of detail where we can know exactly what all of this means. But I'm pretty sure that Cornelius, in Acts chapter number 10, is an example of what Jesus meant in Luke chapter 11. Because Cornelius was seeking, he was asking God for more info, and God responded. And there are people all across this globe who are seeking for more knowledge about the Creator God. The one they see in creation, the one they realize must exist because of the moral law written on their hearts. And they're seeking for more truth. And I believe that Luke chapter 11 shows God's heart, which is that if you're responding to the light He's already given you, God will provide more light. And that is what we see in Acts chapter number 10 with Cornelius. Let's go down to verse number 30 in our text, and we'll see Cornelius' own account as he's talking to Simon Peter. Cornelius said in verse number 30, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour, again this would be about 3 p.m., I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. We saw earlier in the chapter, this is an angel of God, and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard. Cornelius has been asking for something. And so here, thy prayer is heard, and thine alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. And then what's the next step? Send therefore to Joppa, and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon a tanner by the seaside, who when he cometh shall speak unto thee. You may remember earlier on in our presentation we read from Romans chapter 10 verse 14, where it mentions the role of the preacher sharing the word of God. And that's not referring just to a pastor, but to people proclaiming the gospel message. And here in this passage, here is that same role of Simon Peter being that preacher sharing the gospel with a lost man, Cornelius. So, so the angel tells Cornelius, hey, you need to reach out, find this preacher, Peter, and have him come to you. And when he cometh, verse number 32, shall speak unto thee. Immediately, therefore, I, Cornelius, sent to thee, Peter, and thou hast well done that thou art come. I want you to look at that verse carefully. The Bible says, Now therefore are we all here present before God. It doesn't just say, here's Cornelius on his own, ready to hear this message of Peter. But Cornelius, who is seeking the truth, now gathered people from his household and his influence as centurion around him to, in verse number 33, to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. And so you see this group of people there ready and willing to listen to the message of salvation. I want you to note who Cornelius was. Cornelius was, as verse number 1 tells us, a Roman soldier. Let me just pause there. As we think about our goals and the, the direction God has put for our lives, we are going to a part of the world that, frankly, in America, many people would simply view as the enemy. Am I right? We're going to a part of the world where many Americans would just really don't care about. And they don't really care about what's happening over there in many cases because of history. And there's a lot that we could go into there. But it's very easy for us to neglect those people that we would consider as the enemy and to neglect the need they have for the gospel. And right here in Acts chapter number 10, this man Cornelius in verse number 1, the first description of him is as a Roman officer. He's not exactly a friend of the Jewish people by his role. Because the Roman soldiers and the Roman military and the Roman Empire was viewed as the enemy. You think about physically speaking, when Jesus Christ was crucified, physically speaking, the people who crucified Him were Roman soldiers. Now, let's be careful and remember that we can't just push the blame on the Roman soldiers of the day or the Jewish people who chanted for His crucifixion. We must realize that we are individually responsible for the crucifixion of, our, of the Son of God. Why? Because of our sins. We are the ones who are held responsible. We are responsible for our Savior's death. Does that make sense? 
And so here's, here they are in the first century, and, Rome, and, and Peter didn't exactly have the greatest relationship with Rome, and the Jewish people didn't have the greatest relationship with Rome. They would view them as the enemies, and yet right here in Acts chapter number 10, Peter, the one who was ready to pull out his sword and fight, who took off the ear of the servant of the high priest when the soldiers came to arrest Jesus Christ, that same Peter is the one that God is using to reach back out to the enemy to proclaim the truth. I want you to remember that regardless of where you are right now, regardless of what comfort zone or what what rut you've fallen in, the habits that you have and that I have, let's make sure that we are willing to proclaim the gospel message to the people that we aren't friends with, to the people that we may not care that much about. Because God cares for them and God loves them just as much as he loves you and he loves me. And it's very easy for us to, to, to get bad relationships with neighbors and, and with family and, and to, to lose relationships along our way. But let's remember that more important than our own pride is the message of Christ and what he's done for those people. And I don't know what that means in your own life and your own experiences, but let's remember that God has us as lights for his message of truth in a lost and dying world, a dark world. There are seekers who want the truth. And even among groups classified as the enemy, there are people desiring to know the Creator and Redeemer. To this point in Acts chapter number 10, Cornelius has been to some level devoted to God and worship of Him. But he only has a small part of God's revelation of Himself. At this point, he has not heard about Christ's finished work. And there are a lot of people around this world who know there's a Creator, who know there's a God who who wrote the moral law in our hearts, as we mentioned earlier, who's given us a conscience that bears witness, but they don't know about what Jesus has done. And that's where we as Christians find our role in sharing Christ. And that's what the Word of God finds its witness in, in sharing Christ, not only as a tool for us to grow, but as a a message of salvation to the lost. There are seekers in many places. And so... Just for a moment, I want us to think about how we prioritize. In Romans chapter 15, Paul is writing to the church at Rome. And uh, he had not been there to the church at Rome, but he wanted to be involved. He wanted to go. He wanted to be involved in the fruit uh, there in that ministry. And in Romans chapter 15, he explains why he hasn't come to Rome yet. And he explains that for him and the way God has directed his life and ministry... He needs to go to all these uttermost areas around the Mediterranean that had not yet heard the name of Jesus Christ even named. So he writes to the church at Rome and he says, well, you guys are, you're, you're filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. They were to some level spiritually mature enough to share Christ with their neighbors and their family and their friends. And the gospel message was already continuing past that first generation of believers in the church at Rome. So here's Paul, and he's saying, for the way God has directed my heart, I need to go to those who have not heard. And I don't know where God has you. You know, I'm not not saying God wants every one of you to come with us to to the mission field. God has a role for you, though. And God has a role for you to be a light in your community to those who have not heard. But I think God also wants all of us to be involved, not just in our own Jerusalem, if you will, but in all aspects of the Great Commission that we all would have involvement in getting the gospel out in our neighborhood, in our country, but also around the world. But how do we prioritize? Stories abound of the difficulties faced during World War II, both here in the States and especially, as we'll focus on here, in Europe. Here in the States, a few months ago, I was with my grandparents and I got to see some of their ration cards from World War II. I don't know if some of you have seen those before. That was really neat. You know, you were limited on being able to buy certain foods and you couldn't buy new tires for a vehicle if you had one. And there were a lot of, of, of inconveniences during the, war t- during the wartime. I was reading a book a few months ago and it was focused on Warsaw, Poland. And in Europe, with the war ravaging on in places like Warsaw, there were a whole lot more challenges faced than here in the States. And there were people, there were rations Uh, for people, but those rations were not enough to actually sustain life for very long. And so people were buying things on the black market and and getting getting the food that they needed in other ways beyond just the rations. 
But within Warsaw, there was a certain area that was walled off for just the Jewish people. We know it as the Warsaw Ghetto. And in that area, it wasn't the same rations as the rest of the city. In that area, people on a daily basis were starving to death because of the lack of food. As I think about that time period, and there's so many other illustrations we could have even in the last decade of similar situations. There were inconveniences faced here in the States. There were significant difficulties and challenges faced in Warsaw and much of Europe. But I think all of us realize that the greatest need in that case was in that Warsaw ghetto, in our, in our story here, and the people who were starving to death on a daily basis. There is a need, and let's not forget it. I'm not trying to minimize it. There is a need for us to continue to share the gospel with the people around us and to start churches in the States. And that is very important, and I'm all for it, and I'm behind you. But let's not lose focus that we need to not just focus on those around us, but we need to reach out to those who without our help would never hear. Here in the States, you know, I grew up in an area with a lot of Muslim people, and I could just go back to that area and proclaim Christ in that area, and that would be, that would be a worthwhile life worth living. It would be a life worth living. And yet, those people do have access to the truth. Now, we should still go tell them, but they do have access. And God broke my heart for those people across this globe who, without us getting involved, have no hope. And so as we look at Romans chapter 15 and we look at Acts chapter number 10, what we're seeing is the apostles going out there to those who had no hope without them getting involved. It's easy to get so focused on the needs among our groups, and they're important, that we forget about the vast needs in other people groups around the country. In John chapter 4, verse 35, the Bible says, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. So as we think about this story in Acts chapter number 10, the first character we see is the seeker. The people who are lost and are looking for the truth. And I I don't know very many of you very well, you know. I've met most of you this morning. And I don't know where you are in your spiritual journey, and maybe you're still at that point where you're searching for the truth. Let me just encourage you, take advantage of today and the opportunity you have, because you're not guaranteed tomorrow. Take advantage of the opportunity you have to find out what Jesus Christ has done for you with his sacrifice on the cross and resurrection. And we'd be happy to talk to you about that. That first character is the seeker, but the second character in the gospel crossing new frontiers is the most important character in our story, the master of it all, God himself. People are seeking the truth, and God, from our text, orchestrates his mission. What we need to do is trust in the sovereign, omniscient God. Let's go back to Acts chapter number 10, verse number 3. There is the vision, evidently, about the ninth hour. And uh, so you have this one side of the equation where Cornelius is, is, is uh, told about Peter. And then you get to verse number 9. The Bible says, on the morrow, as they went on their journey, Cornelius' delegation to Simon, they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, and Peter, Simon Peter, went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. (coughs) Excuse me. This would be about noontime. And unsurprisingly at noon, if you're like me, verse number 10, and he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And you could go down. We're not going to take the time to read all of these verses here. But there is a vision of a sheep being let down from heaven three different times. And inside that sheet are different animals, these unclean animals that did not fit within the kosher laws of the Jewish people. And he is told, Peter is told to rise, kill, and eat. And Peter, who endeavored to be a good Jew, halted at this command. Because he had not let any unclean thing cross his lips. And in verse number 17, after this had happened three times, the sheets brought back up to heaven, the Bible says, Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, both the men which were sent from Cornelius had made enquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision... And while these men are out there at the gate, the Bible says, The Spirit said unto him, unto Peter, Bold, three men seek thee. 
Arise therefore, and get thee down, and go with them doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Peter's in this rut. He's in this comfort zone where he's preaching Christ to the Jews. And God uses this vision to get him to not call unclean, to not call common what God had told him to do. So God's told him to do something. Peter's supposed to go, even though he normally wouldn't go to a Gentile's house, even though he normally wouldn't go to a Roman soldier's house, a Roman officer's house. God gets involved to prompt Peter in this mission. Many times, God orchestrates our interactions with other people, but we need to trust the sovereign God. You see, God is the ruler of the universe, and he has a plan for each and every one of our lives, but are we willing to be used by him? In situations that are beyond us and beyond our abilities and our comfort zones, we need to recognize that there is one beyond us who's not surprised or thwarted. He has a plan. But even in those situations, which are many, where we think we are in control, let's not lose reliance on the one who knows the end from the beginning. Let's trust in the sovereign God. God's the one who fashioned our hearts. God's the omniscient God. And God has a purpose for you this week. But are we willing to be used by him? And so as we look at our text, the first character is the seeker looking for the truth. The second is the sovereign God. Will we be used by him? And the third character in the gospel crossing new frontiers is the disciple. People are seeking the truth. God orchestrates his mission and disciples are used to reach new frontiers. We need to get involved in the need. And so we look at our text and um, you'll see, we've already seen Peter getting involved. In, um, In Acts chapter 10, verse number 19, the Bible says, Well, Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Verse 20, Arise therefore, get thee down, go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. So Peter gets to Cornelius, and uh, he he goes to Cornelius, and and you go to verse number 22. uh, You see a description of who Cornelius is and the need. Verse number 24, Cornelius waited for them, had called together his kinsmen and friends. And in verse 34, Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Aren't you grateful for that? And you go on in that same context, verse number 35, but in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Let's read the context. Verse 36, the word which God sent unto the children of Israel. Preaching what? Preaching peace. Where does peace come? By Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. And in the following verses, Peter gets down into the details of the gospel. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Verse 39, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. And then verse 40, him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. And then Peter acknowledges in verse 41 his role as a witness that God had, had, had revealed himself to. That Jesus had, had revealed himself to. And you get to verse number 33, to him, to Jesus, give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Shall receive, the idea is forgiveness of sins. And so Peter, although initially he, he halted at this idea of crossing over this barrier to the unclean, he now goes, he preaches the gospel, and you see an amazing response as people hear the truth of Christ. As Peter proclaims the message of peace. And so as we look at this chapter, in Acts chapter number 10, we saw three, three individuals, three people, three people involved in the gospel going forth. The first was the seeker. The second is the sovereign God who fortunately involves himself in our world. And he has a plan for each of our lives. And thirdly, we see the disciple. And that, if we've accepted Jesus Christ, is our opportunity to follow Christ and get the gospel message out. In Acts 10, 10, verse 28, Peter said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company, or come unto one of another nation. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. That was the barrier for Peter. That was the barrier that was crossed in Acts chapter number 10. And for the rest of the book of Acts, you know what you see? The gospel going forth not just to the Jewish people, but to the Gentiles. It crosses in Acts chapter 11. And then in Paul's ministry throughout, you see Gentiles all across the Mediterranean world coming to Christ. 
and for probably the majority of us in this room today, that applies to us as well. The gospel eventually made it to us, to the nations. But now it's our turn. And what's going to be our involvement in getting that gospel to someone else? Maybe someone that we have a little bit of enmity towards, but someone who God loves and who God wants to see come to him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. And Lord, there's a lot that we could learn from Acts chapter number 10. And this morning, we've just focused on these three different people, these three different characters in this story, and their different roles. Lord, I pray that if there's someone here who's still seeking the truth, Lord, I pray that you would soften their hearts towards the gospel and help them to come to faith in you and your son. Lord, we trust in you. I pray that you'd help us each to trust in you this week and your involvement in our lives. And I pray that you'd give us opportunity to reach beyond to share the gospel. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us all as disciples of your son to continue to get out of our comfort zone to get the gospel out. Lord, I pray that you'd work in each of our lives and show yourself strong. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would stand with me this morning. I don't know if the Lord's working on your heart. There's a lot of lessons we could learn from this chapter. But maybe you are that seeker. Now is the time you could take to come here, to talk to pastor, to talk to myself, ask some questions, and find out the, the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Maybe you've accepted Christ, but maybe there's some area of your life where you've been holding back. And God wants you to cross that barrier, to get out of that comfort zone, to get out of that rut a little bit to follow him. If that's you, you can pray in your seat. You can come down here if you want. I don't know. Let the Lord work in your heart as we endeavor to be disciples, allowing the Lord to use us in our community.